Welcome to the Complete History of Beer, Members, Episode 4. I'm your host, Eris Avery. Grab your favorite alcoholic beverage and let's get started. Today, we're going to be trying two beers. Um, I tried to find L's, as L's are the most common type of beer that you're going to find within ancient history, as in fact, lagers actually didn't come around until much later with the invention of refrigeration, or technically, as we'll get into, within colder regions of Czech and Germany, in which they were able to um, use ice or do it in within a cold cave. But ultimately, I was able to find a beer from the Netherlands, Heineken, which sort of relates to our opening piece of mythology. And I found a beer from Italy, which we'll play in later once we start talking about Rome. So to start, what you want to do is wet your glass a little bit. Um, the reason we do that is so that way you don't get friction created when you're pouring the beer. So you want to go ahead and kind of tilt the glass pour it down the side. So basically what we're doing is trying not to create too much foam because this is a uh, carbonated drink. Once you get far enough through, then you can go ahead and actually tilt it straight in. Um, there's quite a bit of foam on this, um, but that is also expected as this is a little bit more narrow at the top of the glass. Next up, we have a uh, Peroni, which is the Italian beer that I'll be trying today. Um, on a side note, I actually have some memorabilia going on right now, because several decades ago, Rupert Beer was actually owned by my family. So again, we are going to pour down the side, trying to avoid getting too much foam, and pouring straight in. I did recently actually get my beer server certification through Cicerone, so I got to learn quite a bit about beer so let's go ahead and start with the tasting. I'm gonna start with the Heineken. So I'm smelling it, it's very light. Um, it's a very smooth kind of smell. Almost a little bit of a, uh, like a fruitiness, kinda. It's definitely a very light beer, very easy. Um, doesn't really have any crazy notes either way. It's not super bitter, not super hoppy. Honestly, overall, pretty good beer. The next one is going to be the Peroni. It does have a little bit more of a, I don't know, stronger smell to it. Um, it's a little bit more poignant. I'm having a hard time placing the flavor I'm getting specifically. Um, it definitely has almost sour tartness kind of to it. It's not really dry, though. It is a little bit more hoppy, that's for sure. Not really getting um, as much sweet. And it's actually not as bitter as the Heineken. The Heineken was a little bit more initially bitter. I feel like with this one, I'm getting a little bit more of a, of a mouthfeel with it, though. A little less taste, a little bit more um, carbonation in my mouth. Feels almost like a little bit heavier initially on the front of the mouth and then kind of more on the back of the mouth. Definitely going to have to say... I like the Heineken a little bit better. There is a place where great warriors go after death. A place where Odin and Thor will welcome you with open arms. This place is Valhalla. For those who have earned entrance into this great realm, you will live out in eternity as a warrior, fighting every day on the field in preparation for Ragnarok, the apocalypse which has been foretold for millennia. After each great day of valor and victory, all in Valhalla are greeted at the Great Banquet Hall with food and beer. The beer comes from Hydran, the mighty goat. Hydran eats from the tree of life, creating a never-ending flow of beer from his udders. The history of beer begins with the history of human civilization out of Mesopotamia. A common belief is hunter-gatherer groups found it difficult to produce beer as migratory people, and so switched into sedentary society to produce beer more easily. This is certainly plausible, 
However, I do think there may have been multiple causes for settling down into what we now call civilization. For instance, the ability to grow food, being able to care for children, elderly, and sick people, and the advantage you gain from having a more secure lifestyle, both from having walls around you and a steady supply of food. But beer is certainly a great benefit for settling down somewhere and not trying to carry around large fermenting pots. The first production of beer as we know it today is generally agreed to be from Sumer around 4000 BCE. The earliest piece of literature in existence today is the Epic of Gilgamesh. In it, there is a story of a friend of Gilgamesh, a man named Enkidu. He was actually only part man, as he was also half, well, not man, I guess. In any case, he was raised by animals in the wild and then later entered society with a woman named Shamat. He is given bread and beer, but is confused by this offering. Shamat explains bread is the lifeline of mankind and beer is what civilized people drink. So he enjoys some beer and around seven pitchers in, he gets absolutely plastered and passes out. Oh wait. Apparently, he has a super liver, as following seven pitchers of beer, he becomes human? Fully human, as opposed to half-man beast? This transition into civilization through beer is thought to showcase beer in relation to the formation of civilization, and the evolution from barbaric hunter-gatherers to sedentary society. While the actual origin of beer is unknown, we do know if grain is left out in the rain, it will start malting, the first step in the process of brewing beer. Assuming someone tried to make bread out of the wet, starchy grain, they would then heat it, causing a release of sugar, which would then simply need yeast or bacteria from the air to get into it and start the fermenting process. This certainly sounds similar to the origin the Sumerians gave for beer, to the goddess Ninkasi, who was over, of all things, beer. She is credited with teaching man how to make beer, which was called kas. Ninkasi was known as, quote, the one who waters the malt on the ground, bakes the papier malt in the great oven, soaks the malt in a jar, end quote. An interesting feature in their brewing process was a layer of sediment, which often formed in beer and led many to drink beer with a straw. Imagine the looks you might get if you were to order a beer today at a bar and ask for a straw with it. Beer was consumed by all classes of Sumerian society, from its kings to the poor, including women. We see how essential beer was to the Sumerians from a proverb known as the lamentation over the destruction of Sumer and Ur. In it, the city of Ur is stated to be lacking beer and bread, and as a result of this lack, it was stated the city was considered unable to support people living there anymore. The Sumerians were eventually conquered by the Babylonians, leading to a spread of knowledge of brewing beer. In fact, the earliest evidence of brewing comes from 5,000 years ago in Babylonia, where the rich soil of the Fertile Crescent made for a perfect location to grow grains. There is no record of beer being regulated by the Sumerians, but the great king of Babylonia, Hammurabi, certainly regulated beer in his code of law, the earliest recorded laws still in existence. He established a regulation on beer prices for brewers and innkeepers. He also classified beer into 20 different categories, with some being barley, some wheat, others a mix of grains, and some distinguished by color. Aged beer was also its own category, although typically for export to Egypt. Beer arrived in Egypt in the pre-dynastic period. Pre-dynastic referring to the period before recorded history in Egypt, placing beer's arrival sometime around 3100 BCE. It became the healthier alternative to water, which carried many microbes, and so was a common and popular beverage throughout ancient Egyptian history. Beer was not typically brewed at a very high alcohol content, and had an overall shorter shelf life. As a result, it needed to be brewed on a daily basis, and consumed shortly after brewing. 
Throughout its history, Egypt was well equipped to grow grain, even being known in later antiquity as the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. Bread and beer production became a major source of income for Egypt. It was also a common form of payment for labor. Similar to Mesopotamia, we find beer in Egyptian mythology, with Osiris, the god of agriculture, holding a beer staff. Like in Babylon, beer was categorized with some being for ceremonial purposes and others being based on attributes like its color, sweetness, or thickness. Still, other beers were known as friends' beers or beer of the protector. The gods who guarded Osiris's shrine drank a beer of truth. Keep in mind, Egyptians were very concerned about life after death. So don't worry for those facing the afterlife, as there were beers made to be buried with the dead, such as beer that doesn't sour, and a beer which must have been made of water from the fountain of youth, as it was known as beer of eternity. Interestingly, women were the primary brewers of beer, and this was common practice in many societies until the end of the Middle Ages. Much like in Mesopotamia, beer was drank by all members of Egyptian society, from pharaohs to slaves. Egyptian mythology gives Osiris credit for the creation of beer. He is said to have gifted mankind with culture, agriculture, and beer. There certainly is an interesting parallel between establishing agriculture and beer, as we talked about at the start of the episode, and the development of culture is changed by sedentary society in which there is now time for people to create literature and art, as well as think about things like math and science. So in essence, agriculture led the way for more development of culture, and may have been a result of beer, or at the very least, an added bonus to growing grains. We also know Egypt's biggest rival in the Bronze Age were the Hittites, who saw beer as second only to bread. They, like many others, used beer for ceremonial purposes, as well as general consumption. It was also common for them to drink beer through reeds or straws, like in Sumer. We can assume the practice was likely shared with them through the Assyrians, an empire which conquered Babylonia and Israel, further spreading beer culture in the Near East. The Hittite Empire spanned from the Assyrian Empire on its east throughout what is today Turkey, placing it right on the border of the ancient Greek world. The ancient Greeks were heavily influenced by Egypt, although not by beer. The Greeks gave credit to the Egyptians for inventing beer, even believing they introduced beer to Greece. Yet, it is also likely beer came in from Turkey, possibly from Phrygian or Lydian influence, two groups which were known to drink beer and which had heavy contact and influence on the Greek world sitting on the edge of Turkey. Another alternative is the Phoenicians, who were a major sea power in regards to trade in the ancient world. Phoenicians is Greek for people of red, and we know they were trading in beer and grains in the Greek world, including Sicily and Crete, even shipping beer as far west as Spain and along the coast of North Africa. But the Greeks saw sprouted malt as just rotted grain, and so preferred wine. I previously talked about the Greek god of wine, Dionysus, in our episode on the history of wine, but I didn't mention his teacher. It seems only fitting the god of wine would have a teacher who was the god of beer, Silenus. Silenus basically raised Dionysus, and of course taught him the ways of drinking alcohol, or more accurately, the ways of partying and getting absolutely wasted. He did, however, gain the ability to see prophecies. In fact, his powers of prophecy were so well-renowned that King Midas held him prisoner as a way of obtaining information about the future. This led Dionysus to become concerned for his missing drinking buddy, and when he found Silenus, Dionysus was so thrilled, he granted King Midas the ability to turn anything he touched into gold. Even after Greeks took control of Egypt under Alexander the Great, beer culture didn't take off in the Hellenic world, being seen as a drink of the conquered. 
This didn't hinder Egypt, however, as they continued to export beer to Palestine and other parts of the Near East. Under the Greeks, Egyptian beer was taxed and regulated by the government. There were even positions for inspectors created, with titles like Inspector of the Breweries and Royal Chief Beer Inspector. The Greek Ptolemy dynasty, which controlled Egypt, was eventually replaced by a Roman governor after Emperor Augustus defeated Cleopatra, conquering Egypt. Rome, like Greece, preferred wine over beer. A Roman, Diodorus Siculus, in his Bibliotheca Historica, praised Egyptian beer, stating, quote, They make a drink of barley. For smell and sweetness of taste, it is not much inferior to wine. End quote. He went on to credit the Greek god Dionysus, who was incorporated into Roman mythology as Bacchus, with inventing beer. Although this seems to contradict what we already discussed about Dionysus's preference for wine over beer, and in fact there is a legend about Dionysus fleeing Mesopotamia in disgust of the local inhabitants' preference for beer. Another man by the name of Pliny the Elder mentioned beer in his work Natural History. It is interesting to note he is called Elder, and his son is Pliny the Younger, which sounds much cooler than Senior and Junior, in my opinion. His work, which laid the foundation for our modern encyclopedia, stated, quote, The populace of Western Europe have a liquid which they intoxicate themselves, made from grain and water. The manner of making this is somewhat different in Gaul, Spain, and other countries, and it is called by different names. But its nature and properties are everywhere the same. The people in Spain in particular brew this liquid so well that it will keep good a long time. So exquisite is the cunning of mankind in gratifying their vices and appetites that they have invented a method to make water itself produce intoxication. End quote. I guess Pliny hadn't heard of the guy over in the Middle East miraculously turning water into wine around the same time. I think Jesus was his name. And actually, on a side note, most of what people were drinking in Palestine at this time was beer. So there is speculation that often what is referred to as wine in the New Testament and possibly the Old Testament might actually have been referring to beer. As Rome expanded across Western Europe, they encountered many groups of people with long and rich histories of beer. The Celts in Britannia, the Germanic people in Gaul, and the Slavic people to the east all drank beer as part of their culture. The Romans typically saw beer as a drink of the barbarians. But as their empire incorporated many of these groups and added their men to their ranks in the army, Beer consumption was present in some of the armies, even if somewhat taboo. But like all great things, the Western Roman Empire eventually collapsed, and with it led to a dark age for beer. This is probably an oversimplification, and using the term dark age is sort of inaccurate, as there was a flourishing, even if somewhat diminished, culture in Europe during this time. In fact, after Rome became a Christian empire and imposed religion on the rest of Europe, there were many thriving monasteries all across Europe with active and somewhat alcoholic monastic life. Back in the Middle East at this time, coffee overtook alcohol as the preferred beverage. See, as Islam spread across the Middle East, it brought with it laws and social norms which saw beer as harmful and, like coffee in early history, satanic. So beer consumption was, and still is, nearly non-existent in the Islamic world. However, in Europe, we see a development in beer history. Wine was largely popular in the early medieval period, but beer replaced wine drinking for many in the later medieval period of the 14th and 15th century. Beer consumption became rather high for reasons that we talked about previously with the ability to kill off microbes in water and as a result was also typically lower in alcohol, just like many ancient beers. 
there was in fact a beer created known as table beer or kids beer as a drink for children and laborers. Small beer, as it is also known, has somewhere around 0.5% alcohol to 2.8% alcohol, meaning it was cheaper to produce and so became popular in the medieval period and later in colonial North America as it was much cheaper to produce and didn't get people quite as intoxicated. As to why beer overtook wine in popularity, a large part of the reason was due to a European country in the 13th century who figured out how to properly use hops to control and bring out flavors in beer. This country, which still acts as a leader in the beer industry today, is Germany. If you want to hear the story of German, Czech, Belgian, British, and Irish beer, as well as many other major beer producing regions of the world, then head over to Patreon and consider supporting this podcast series to listen to part two and three of our episodes on beer history. For the price of a pint a month, you can support this and future shows in this series and get more members' episodes on coffee, tea, wine, and more. And stay tuned for the return of Germany and our story of coffee history as Germany fights the largest war it has ever faced. Not as a beer drinking country, but as a war machine fueled by coffee. I speak, of course, of the First World War. As we talked about earlier, the first evidence of beer is thought to be from the Sumerian city of Uruk, but there continues to be finds by archaeologists which point to earlier periods. One find dates beer to 7000 BCE in China, another points to 10,000 BCE in Golden Tempe, and another places beer all the way back to the 11th century BCE in Israel. It is possible our understanding of beer history may continue to expand as time goes on, and who knows, we may even discover new and different ways it was made in the past which could impact the way we drink beer today. To close, here is a quote from the Greek philosopher Plato. He is a wise man who invented beer.